Hello, my name is Bill Johnson and I'm from the Microsoft Azure SRE team. Today I'm going to talk to you about sustainable software engineering and how that relates to SREs. By sustainable here, I am referring to environmental sustainability. And usually a talk about you know, the environment or climate is filled with some you know, dramatic images of polar bears or you know, raging wildfires. You know, there's usually a dramatic headline or two thrown in about glaciers melting and oceans rising. You know, certainly an extreme hockey stick graph showing how much carbon we're emitting as a society. And you can almost guarantee to see an image of thick black smoke billowing out of a smokestack. Uh, all these tend to conclude that the overall temperature of the planet is causing mass extinctions of species, relocating populations, and wiping out entire countries. You know, it's all very doom and gloom. You know, and while, while this is all very important, uh, the overwhelming nature of that doom and gloom is that it makes it hard to process and prioritize what could and really should be done. So I'm going to try and frame this in a, in a different way today. Our planet has an SLO. The average global temperature rise needs to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius as measured from pre-industrial revolution times. And for anyone like me that hasn't memorized timelines for history, you know, that's roughly the late 1700s. Uh, it's important to note that this is an average across the globe, so some places are already past this point. Um, if the planet breaches its SLO, there will be severe impact to its users the humans, animals, and plants that, that live on the Earth. As of this recording today, our SLO value is 1.15 degrees Celsius, and we're about 12 years away from breaching that 1.5 degree line. You can see these numbers for yourself over at climateclock.net, and you know, the website, you know, true to form, even plays a sad song for you while you watch the numbers change because, you know, doom and gloom and all. But you know what, we're, we're SREs and you know, we have an SLO defined, we have an active monitor of it, so we should be able to do something about this, right? And not just do something about this, but be critical pieces for the solution and maintenance of our planet's SLO. So in our day-to-day -day work, SREs are constantly playing that balancing game of technical and operational aspects of a system. You know, I'm defining technical here as any of those hardware and software choices you make for the engineering system. Uh, these can be anything like uh, programming language, uh, architectures that you use, frameworks, you know, the tech stack, etc. All those, all those different things. And then the operational side of things captures all that human toil that's needed to maintain the technical system. Uh, and so that includes things like on-call, problem management, observability, any of your various team processes that you follow. And, and these two areas are, are typically separate roles with software engineers focusing primarily on the technical piece and ops engineers focusing on primarily the operational piece. But you know, SRE has brought these two together in a balance in order to kind of drive reliability through the entire system. And that reliability can take many, many different forms. You know, it's not just the code or the test cases we write. It's the architecture of the system. It's the relationships and trust we form with our colleagues. It's the blameless and, and learning cultures that we cultivate every day and the, and the infinite curiosity that, that leads to consistent reliability. And really, our goal is not just reliability, but maintaining that reliability over time. And reliability over time is a really great way to define sustainability. And, and that's why I believe that there, there's a missing piece in what we do in our roles as SRE, and that's environmental sustainability, or as defined here, the impact on the planet of our technical and operational choices. You know, th this speaks to that reliability over time for a system, and, and more specifically it has to do with things like your carbon emissions, or the power sources for your hardware, or you know, resource utilization, the waste from your technical choices that, that you generate. You know, we, we live in a world of ephemeral drives and virtual machines and things that can be just thrown away in an essentially infinitely resourced cloud. And, and that's great and, and super useful for our jobs. But we've done that at the neglect of the long term and we, we have to bring it back into the equation. And in, in fact, I would I would go so far as to say that, you know, we really are focusing on sustainability in all three of these areas. Right. And it's not just reliability of our systems. 
in the same way that, that we've balanced the, the technical and the operational pieces, we need to also balance the, the environmental and, and long-term effects. And, and that key is balance. You know, the, the most sustainable system is, is the one that's never built. You can't swing too far in one direction and overcompensate. Borrowing from, from game theory and economics here, you want to find the, the Pareto optimal point between these three areas where they're maximizing each of their own benefits without disproportionately negatively impacting the others. Uh, you know, th this point will shift around in time as new technologies emerge and reliability changes and power grids evolve and business rules and priorities change. So you find that point and, and maintain it. You know, we'll, we'll always have to build things. It's, it's part of our job, but we can do it in an intentional and principled way to kind of ban balance all three of these sustainable areas. You know, similarly to how security is part of what we do, sustainable software engineering should also be part of what we do. And, and luckily, principles.green has is, is defined these for you. So the first one is you know, build applications that are carbon efficient. You know, that means minimizing the amount of carbon emitted per unit of work. Um, build applications that are energy efficient. You know, if you create anything for mobile devices, you're probably well aware of this already and, and how your code affects battery life. Um, sustainable software engineering takes responsibility for the electricity it consumes and is built in a way that minimizes consumption of that energy. You know, run servers and machines at a high rate of utilization. Take advantage of, of what you already have and minimize the wasted cycles and resources. You know, understand the carbon intensity behind your system. Uh, a carbon intensity value is, is calculated by how many grams of carbon is required to produce a kilowatt hour of, ele of that electricity. Uh, minimize the embodied carbon in your hardware by extending the lifetime of your machines. Uh, re reduce the amount of data and the distance it has to travel across to your network. Um, maybe shape your supply rather than shaping, uh, shaping your demand to your supply rather than shaping your supply to your demand. You know, make your systems carbon aware. It's, it's similar to the practice of load shedding that, you know, drops deprioritized traffic or non-critical traffic during times of peak load. And then the last one is, you know, look at the whole system rather than just your specific piece to understand where, where you can increase carbon efficiency. Uh, deep, deep diving on all of these principles is an entire talk on its own. And, and you can go read more for yourself at principles.green. It's also on GitHub. So feel free to contribute um, to any of these from your experiences. Um, so instead for this talk, I'm going to focus on a few examples of applying these principles to, to some common scenarios that we'll run into. Uh, so what would this look like for a microservices architecture? You know, for the first step here is focus on your compute utilization. You know, limit the number of cores you need, use the cores that you have more efficiently uh, through maybe more efficient code or improved scaling parameters. Um, similarly, on the storage side, ensure that you've got proper indexing and proper sharding and, and scaling rules to, to minimize power and processing and maximize your energy proportionality. You know, having a more efficient database means more efficient queries, which means less wait time, which means your compute and application are faster. You know, reduce the payloads overall and, and the overall volume of data, as, as well as the distance that it has to travel across the network. Um, Co-locate resources. And then finally, you know, look, look to reduce the number of overall microservices as each one you know, brings an overhead with it. You know, I'm, I'm not advocating here for, for full monolith, um, since you probably have you know, very good business reasons for, for all of your microsystems, but you can move the ones that have tight dependencies on each other to the same nodes or clusters. You know, maybe co-locate them with their storage if they do a lot of reads. Uh, you, you're probably doing some of this already, but you know, viewing these through the lens of environmental sustainability changes, it, it, it adjusts the priority and the value of the work. So let's look at a different example here that has to do with carbon intensity. Uh, so renewable energy sources like solar or wind, they, they take very little carbon to produce energy. Uh, however, when you know the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, they, they have to be supplemented by other sources like coal or gas. Um, and, and those take much more carbon to produce the same amount of energy. So that means the carbon intensity for a power grid has these natural fluctuations like you know this chart from one of California's power grid shows. You know, your system can take advantage of these fluctuations to reduce your overall carbon footprint. And, and one way to do this is intentionally delay workloads and run them during carbon intensity 
lower carbon intensity time periods. You know, the same one hour job could be 40% less intense at various times throughout the day from nothing else than just running at a different time. Uh, anything that doesn't require an immediate result to return, like, like batch processing, for example, is, is a great candidate for, for an approach like this. But you know, in addition to kind of shifting your workloads in time, you could also move them in locations around the world that have more renewable energy and are, are a lower carbon intensity overall. Uh, you know, this is a map from a service called Watt Time, Watt Time and that shows grid emissions for, for power grids across the world. And, and you can see which, which regions emit less carbon overall and use that to reduce your baseline emissions. You know, some grids are cleaner than others, but they do fluctuate. And so if you use Kubernetes, let's say, you can customize the scheduler to take advantage of these fluctuations by setting carbon intensity value as a preference in the scheduling, scheduling algorithm. You know, the scheduler can automatically evaluate and select regions with low carbon emissions for you without having to think about it at all. And then let's do one more example here. Let's say, let's say there's an industry that mines a resource, you know, and they, they refine that resource and, and do a bunch of processing on it. And then they go and they sell it for a lot of money. Um, but that industry has a very large negative impact on the environment. You likely might think that I'm talking about the oil industry, and that's definitely a true statement, but I'm actually talking about AI and the AI industry and the amount of data it consumes and processes. So computation costs of AI models have been doubling every few months, and they've increased 300,000 times in just six years. So all that compute produces a lot of carbon emissions. Um, so let's, let's try and put that in perspective for a second here. So a round trip flight between New York and San Francisco has a carbon footprint of about 1,984 pounds of CO2, right? Um, the average carbon footprint of a person over, a, over an entire year, it's about five times that, uh, you know, 11,023. Um, you know, um, specifically Americans are about three times worse in, in emissions over a course of a year. So that number goes up to about 36,000. You know, over its entire lifetime, a car in the U.S., this includes, you know, the manufacturing of it, this includes the fuel, uh, a car is going to produce around 126,000 pounds of CO2. And then now we come to the 213 million parameter NLP algorithm. Uh, it is going to have, just this one algorithm is going to produce 626. 1,155 pounds of equivalent CO2 based on its compute. That's, that's one round trip flight from New York to San Francisco every single day for almost an entire year. You know, there, there's a whole AI sub-discipline that's kind of spun up around this, this problem. It's called Green AI. And they, they've got some good projects there. There's, there's you know, one like MLCO2 impact that uh, they try to be more transparent about the costs. And, you know, that's good. Just being aware of the numbers and the impact is a fantastic start. But it's, it's still early days on any improvements of, of energy consumption and compute that's required through, through AI. So a lot of these examples kind of point to being really good about optimizations and efficiency. And you know what, that's, that's kind of the secret here and, and ultimately what environmental sustainability is about. You know, being more efficient with the resources you have so you don't need to produce or consume more. You know, the, the three R's of the environment are reduce, reuse, recycle. And there's even a fourth one becoming more popular called refuse. Uh, these also align to good software engineering practices and, you know, refuse new features or machines unless it's necessary. And even then reuse existing code and resources to reduce your overall complexity and effort. You know, if you focus on efficiency at all levels of the system, not just the software and hardware, but what it takes to run them over time, then you can minimize the impact of the system has on the planet. And because of the focus on high utilization and efficiency, carbon efficient systems are typically faster and cheaper. Um, they, they also are, are typically more resilient because of the priority of simplification overall. You know, the focus on carbon emissions just further incentivizes the system to be faster, cheaper, and more reliable over time. You know, but, but wait a second. So haven't we fixed all of our emissions problems because of COVID and we're, everything's going back down with, with people working from home now? And, 
yes, that's true. The emissions have gone down, at least for a few months. You know, I, I like to call it the, the COVID caveat here in this little time that we're in. Um, but the, the pandemic will eventually be over and people will revert back to their carbon emitting ways. You know? And really, the bigger problem here isn't necessarily the day to day emissions. It's all the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. That carbon stays there for years before dissolving. And when it dissolves, it dissolves into the ocean, which causes ocean acidification. And that can last for centuries. You know, there's a ton. I mean, technically, there's dozens of gigatons of, of carbon that's already in the atmosphere now. And so we need to both cut emissions as well as capture the carbon that's there before it dissolves into the ocean. You know, but, but don't worry. There's, there's some really powerful allies here. You know, the three biggest public clouds have, have set some ambitious goals and have, have already made some great progress on renewable energy. You know, both Microsoft and Google have committed to being carbon negative, which is, you know, removing more carbon from the atmosphere than they generate. And they've even committed to removing their entire company historical emissions. And for a company like Microsoft, that's by 2050, that's 75 years worth of carbon that they're taking out of the atmosphere. You know, some other examples, Stripe has, has just released a way for anyone using their payments to automatically direct 1% of their revenue to fund, directly fund carbon removal projects. You know, Apple is making a carbon neutral iPhone and, and they've committed to being carbon neutral as a company by 2030. You know, Amazon is committed to 50% of their shipments being carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, Starbucks, they're going to cut their emissions, their water use and their waste in half by 2030. And then Walmart, you know, they're going to be carbon neutral by 2040. And so that's, that's some of the biggest companies in the world as allies in this effort. And there are efficiency gains everywhere and so much opportunity to reduce emissions and become more resilient that we are not taking advantage of as SREs. So what do we do? What do we do now? What's, what, what can we take away here? Is, you know, the first thing is just ask the question. That's the most important part start the conversation. You know, what are the sustainability goals for yourself, for your team, for your company? What are the SLOs that are aligned to that? You know, SREs are in the perfect position in the stack to have the biggest impact on making software engineers sustainable and driving that reliability over time. You know, ask the question at your metrics meetings, ask the question and design reviews, ask the question at your company all hands, at your team stand up, just in the general Slack channel, you know, wherever you feel comfortable. You know, design for sustainability in your software up front, not just after the fact. And the second thing here, apply the principles. You know, even if your company or your team or yourself don't value sustainability, you do value efficiency and you can still apply the sustainable software engineering principles to your own work and advocate for them in others. And then lastly, just continue the conversation. You, you aren't on this journey alone. You know, keep talking about it, share your progress, share your wins, write blog posts, write tweets about it, you know, help refine the sustainable software engineering principles or, or join online communities like climateaction.tech. You know, and if, and if nothing else, tell me about it. Like, I would love to hear any thoughts or big wins or even huge mistakes, sometimes, especially the huge mistakes. You know, it's, that's how we learn the best. So a habitable planet is the ultimate reliability. And as an SRE myself, I want to make sure that we have one. Thank you.